This show is brought to you by the Garden Gurus and Evergreen Garden Care. Evergreen Garden Care and their market-leading brands are some of the most trusted consumer brands within the garden care market. They produce high-quality garden care products designed to help people create their own green oasis. Whether it's a garden, a balcony or potted indoor plants, they want to inspire anyone, anywhere to be able to easily create and maintain their own garden. To find out more about Evergreen Garden Care, head to www.lovethegarden.com. Garden Express are Australia's leading mail order gardening service, offering a wide range of quality garden products. Each week on the Garden Gurus Live, the team at Garden Express will share a weekly offer. So make sure after today's show, you jump online and visit their website. Hi, welcome to the Garden Gurus Live. I'm Joanne Harris. It's great to be back with you on this Monday morning. I'm filling in for Trevor while he enjoys a well-earned break over in Norfolk Island. It's a great day here in Perth. We had beautiful uh, sunny weather yesterday and it's uh, raining today. So all those plants you put in your garden today, like yesterday are going to be rained in nicely today. Um, in the meantime, since it's raining, you've got a great show for you and here's what's coming up. Um, how's your lawn looking um, as uh, we head into the spring? Last week, Trevor had a chat with um, Love the Garden's Alicia Lamont to get some great lawn care tips. Uh, Rowan from Garden Express uh, will be joining us in the program to show off some beautiful flowering plants. Um, and stay tuned. Later in the show, we'll reveal the winner of our $20,000 edible garden makeover. That's a really exciting one. Um, and if you've got any gardening questions or qu queries, make sure you post them in the comments. Remember to include your suburb and state. That'll make it a lot easier for me, perhaps. Um, and when you're asking gardening questions, make sure you hit the like button. Do that a few times. It's great. Um, we've also got some uh, prize giveaways. So post your questions in the comments with your chance to win. Um, the prizes today, we've got some packets of seeds. Uh, so don't miss out. Okay, so we'll go straight into some questions. Um, and Angela from Tasmania, she put in some uh, some grass. She wanted a grass area and didn't place enough soil down, thinking the grass would grow up to the edges and it's way too short. And how should she fix it? Well, I'm assuming, um, Angela, that you mean that it hasn't grown out towards the edges. So um, two things you could do. If um, it's just a matter of needing the grass to move forward, Put in some good soil around that and some fertiliser and the grass will move out. If you're using a runner grass like a soft buffalo, you can always take some runners and place some runners on the edges also. So that may help you. Um, so um, Alan, uh, Alan is wanting to know, can you please give me the quantities of water, sugar and Vegemite for making our own fruit fly traps? Um, yes, so what you would do is you take a litre bottle Put in a t um, a equal quantities of um, your Vegemite and sugar, and it's usually around about a tablespoon. Um, and then uh, at least, um, add, add probably half the amount of water that you need in that to start with. Um, I also add some uh, peel into it, so some orange or lemon peel. That helps to shake it really well. Um, put some holes in it and place that in your tree. Place it within the foliage. Um, and I tend to... When I'm using um, anything that is a um, organic um, uh, assistance, then uh, make sure that you use perhaps two per tree. If you've got two trees, put in three, and it'll certainly help. So I hope that goes well for you. And if that doesn't work, get down to your local garden center and maybe get a net also and use use the two. Um, now we're over, we're heading out to Southwest Victoria. And Jeanette would like to know, can, she, can the Illawarra flame tree be moved? Um, it's a good question. A lot of natives can't be moved. But I think if you leave it until the milder part of the year, so heading into winter or just coming out of spring, um, or, or coming into spring at least, um, uh, cut around the tree, take a nice big um, uh, 
take a nice big uh, amount out from the tree and uh, make sure that you dig a nice trench around it. Use something like a sea salt product or a, a fish emulsion product and help the roots to establish. Make sure you take as much of the root system as possible. And if you, um, if you find that you've uh, had to cut some of the roots off, um, then make sure you bring the tree down to the appropriate amount. So that can be anything up to about a third of, or 30% uh, would, be, uh, would be a good way to do it. But yes, you can do it um, and just keep an eye on the tree. Make sure that you put it into some really good compost and some good soil uh, that you would use um, in the southwest of Victoria. All right, so I hope that works for you. They're beautiful trees. It'd be great if you could make it work. Um, Philip is in Perth and he has a semi-dwarf lime tree that has been in the ground for a few years and it hasn't really grown much. Any su suggestions? Citrus can be a bit fickle. You know, they like things a little often. So you might find that it needs um, more fertilizer. Um, you might find that perhaps, what did you plant it into? So did you plant it into some good compost? Did you put um, some good mulch around it? Um, if you didn't do that and it's not that large and you therefore the root system won't be huge, you could always take that out and replant it and make sure that you get some really good uh, compost into that soil. Um, it needs it. Um, otherwise, what are you feeding it? Um, again, they like a little a lot, a little more often at least. So if you, um, if you uh, haven't been feeding it particularly well and they like it every six weeks, um, get onto something like the Troforte, the good controlled fertili release fertilizer, and give it a boost with that and see how it goes. Um, and you can often tell if it's not being fed well by the fact that the leaves might have gone a bit yellow. You might have some green veins and yellowing in between. So you may be missing some trace elements. Don't forget in our Perth soils, we don't have a lot of trace elements in our soils. So you do need to give them a good feed. Okay, so good luck with that. And I hope it goes well. Um, Anne doesn't know why her yesterday, today or tomorrow isn't flowering. That's the, the gorgeous Brunsfelsia. Um, again, it might just be that it's um, it needs a good feed. Um, uh, I don't know where you're from, Anne, so I'm not sure as to your conditions. Um, they're relatively hardy plants. You can plant them in an area where you're going to get some hot winds, um, and they should come. You know, they should come along okay. But I would say it's most likely that it's uh, not getting enough fertilizer. So give it a bit of a boost. So. Um, I'm excited to um, welcome our good friend today, uh, Rowan Peterson, back to the show. Um, so good morning, Rowan. Hi, Joanne. How are you today? I'm really well. How are you over there in Melbourne? Um, much better now. We're all out of lockdown. So, um, yeah, we were able to get out over the weekend, which is a, a change from the last, I think, 77 days for the last lockdown. <laughs> That's so fantastic. Out there again and uh, being able to go out and have a meal with friends and things like that. Yeah, that's fantastic. And they can get into their gardens so they can start gardening and, and ordering some more Garden Express plants. Absolutely, absolutely. And the weather's been pretty nice. Um, we've had some really nice weather. The weekend was a little bit cool again, but uh, late last week and I think moving into the rest of this week, we've got some really nice weather coming up, which is great. Perfect. Perfect gardening weather. And this morning you've got a, a trio, um, a special for us. What have you got on offer? Yeah, so so this week we've got a, um, a Budlia trio. So um, Budlias are a beautiful flowering shrub. Um, these ones are the dwarf variety, so um, they don't grow quite as big as the, uh, the traditional uh, Budlias. These ones will grow to about 60 centimetres high. Um, there's three in the collection, um, a beautiful pink one, a, um, a blue to almost deep purple uh, one, and a, um, a more mauvey purple one, which is really, really beautiful. Good collection of colours. Um, I love the Budleys. They're a fabulous little plant. They, you know, they bring in the, the butterflies, the bees, the birds. They're fabulous fodder for all of the wildlife. But they also grow in all sorts of areas too. Like I grow mine in sandy soil. But I've got a girlfriend who grows them beautifully and they're in clay soil. So we're talking being able to send those all over Australia, aren't we? They are. They can go, they can go all over and they are incredibly versatile. Um, yeah. And the really good thing about them is they will flower from 
from spring right through to autumn and sometimes into winter in the warmer climate. So um, they have a beautiful fragrance um, and, like you say, attract the birds, bees, and particularly the butterflies love them because it's a fantastic food source. Yeah, absolutely. So they're also um, frost and drought tolerant. So, again, they go in all sorts of areas. Yeah, and they'll go really well in a pot or a container, but also in the garden. So, because these ones have such a compact growth, have a compact growth habit, they'll only really get to sixty centimeters wide and high. Uh, so yeah. they're for a pot as well. Um, yeah, yeah, really, really, really good. And we've got a fantastic deal. Um, so you'll get, you can get all three. They come in a sixty mil pot, which is um, this sort of size. Yeah. Um, uh, all three for twenty dollars, which is a uh, a twenty five percent saving, which is really fantastic. Great starter plants, and they will take off as soon as you put them in the ground, um, and uh, and be flowering. Like even at the one that I just showed, there's already got a flower on it. So they're you know they're they're in bud already, which is yeah really yeah. good. So they're they're ready to go as soon as you get them and put them in the ground. They really are a fantastic little plant. We sell a lot of them at the garden centre, and I'm sure you're going to do really well with them today. Um, so get on to that and get your 25% off and, and get yourself um, three really beautiful little um, dwarf buddlias. Nice yeah. talking to you today, Rowan. Thanks very much for your time and we'll see you next week. Okay. Thanks, Joanne. Always a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Okay, guys. Well, that's really great. You should get on to it. It's a great deal. Um, we have another fantastic episode of The Garden Gurus coming up this week. Take a look at this sneak peek. Hot weather gardening can have its challenges, but by following a few simple tips that I'll share with you this weekend, you can have some great success. So make sure you catch the Garden Gurus this weekend. That's gonna be a great show. You should have check out Darren. He's, um, very, he's an expert, he's a guru. Um, okay, so we, um, we have someone here who's asking about irrigation. And I'm sorry, I don't have, don't know where you are, but you've got bore water and you don't know where to start. And it's all so complicated, isn't it? It's just so complicated. However, if you start with going to your shire, you'll at least get the rules and understanding of what you can and can't do. And then to be honest, I would ring a, a guru of uh, bore water. I would ring um, someone who knows that, that does deal with bore water all the time, that uh, puts in bores and... Um, that's where I would start, you know, I mean, I've got some information about what you would do with irrigation, but you're much better off. Find, so first of all, find out what you can and can't do within your suburb, within your shire, um, and then get a local that also knows what you can and can't do, um, and then I'd go from there. Good luck with it. It'd be great to have a bore. I don't, so it'd be, and I really regret it. Um, and then we've got Callie, and I don't know where Callie's from, but Callie's got best in she'd like to know the best insect cloth or shade cloth to put over growing roma tomatoes that um and it's as large as 500 mil in a pot with a 900 mil high round trellis and she wants to protect them from the flying insects and provide some shade for the hot summer days well um yeah providing shade for them in the hot summer days is probably important um if you're in a really hot position i don't know where you are i know if you're in perth um, I would be saying to you, keep them out of the hot wind um, and try and protect them from the hot wind. Tomatoes can take a lot of sun. They can take a lot of heat also um, as long as they don't have that hot, uh, what we call here in Perth, the hot easterly wind. Um, so uh, there's quite a few um, different types of um, exclusion netting that would work quite well. Um, I guess if you're going to grow um, plants underneath shade cloth, you're going to need to be at around between 20 and 50%. Um, anything higher than that is great for shading people, but it does stop. And my understanding is that you're better off to use um, a cream or a white colour shade cloth than you are a green So for growing under. So I hope that helps you and you can head off. And again, go to your local... Um, your, your local uh, people that will be able to help you with what's great for your exact area. So we're now off to the Dandenons in Victoria and Angela has asked, one of my fringes panties has gone soft. Soft. I cut a bit off the tree. Will the tree be okay or should I get rid of it? 
um, and that they're all in pots. Um, it's probably rotted. Um, my sense is that that's what it probably is. It's probably rotted. Um, so therefore, um, keep an eye on what you're doing with your other um, trees also, that you're not overwatering them. Um, and by overwatering, I don't mean that you're just being the one that's overwatering them. It could be the weather. It may be that your plants, if they're in pots, are sitting on the ground and they're not getting enough aeration. It might be that uh, the holes that the the roots have actually filled up the, the holes in the pots. And so you need to be able to um, check those, tip the pots over, have a look at them and check that they're not sodden at the bottom because otherwise you'll go from one rotted plant to the rest of them being rotted also. Um, whether you can save it or not, I don't think so. Start again, go down and get another one. Maybe ring Garden Express and see what they've got. Um, okay, so Joe from Melbourne, um, my camellia bushes have just finished flowering and they were beautiful. Aren't they great? I love camellias. When is the best time to give them a heavy prune, please? Now, so you can do that now. Um, I would only take, I never give my, my camellias a really heavy prune, um, but that's where I've got them positioned. Uh, but I tend to take off 30% only. So perhaps give that a, jo uh, a go, Joe, and I hope that works for you. All right, so Cherie is in Bunyip, Victoria, and I have to admit, I don't know where Bunyip is. Uh, but yesterday I discovered two of my indoor plants, a fiddle leaf fig and a philodendron, which were side by side, have mealy bugs, and I sprayed the leaves with eco pest oil and wiped those off that I could see. Do I need to do anything else? Absolutely, you do. So Cherie, when you've got a uh, mealy bug, you, they'll present on the leaf and on the, the stem, but that's the sign of a symptom of something else. And where they happen to be is they'll be in the, the pot um, and you'll need to soak the soil in the pot. I often do that by putting a saucer or a vessel underneath the pot and put the, um, the product that you're using into the, the saucer and let that work in a capillary action so that it goes up through the soil completely and it tends to kill them. Otherwise, if you just do the leaves, they're just gonna to continue to come back for you. So give that a go. All right, uh, and Rachel in Melbourne, my dad's garden is getting quite a few weeds in the garden and veggie patch. I assume we need to mulch. What's the best mulch to use? Okay, so you're in Melbourne. Um, in Perth, I would say to you, there's two different types of mulch that, that we prefer to use. And I would assume that that's the same for you. We have a mulch over here called a lupin mulch that we use, and I often use it on veggies because it feeds the soil extremely well also. Otherwise, you can use something like um, a, a Bailey's mulch is one that we use here, but it's a, it's a thick, chunky mulch. And what it allows this, the water to do is to penetrate down into the soil but because it's thick and chunky and it doesn't have a lot of fibrous content, it doesn't draw back up in a capillary action, the water back up into the mulch. If you end up with something with too much fiber into it, that's what will happen. Your mulch will be nice and moist. You'll think you're doing the right thing. And then all of a sudden you'll find that all your roots are growing up towards where the water is. And then of course the summer comes along and even in Melbourne, you're going to find that it'll burn the roots. So find yourself a good chunky mulch or one with a good amount of food and it also um, natural feed for it. Um, so good luck with that. And you're quite right. You really do need to use a mulch to keep down. Uh, it's one of the best things to keep the weeds down and it saves you time. You can be gardening rather than weeding. weeding. Okay, so um, thanks, Rachel, and good luck with that. So now we're heading into spring um, and how's your lawn looking? I know mine's looking all right at the moment, uh, but coming up to summer, it may not be. So last week, Trevor had a chat with Love the Garden's Alicia Lamont to get some good lawn caring care tips. Take a look at their chat. We've been doing so much work in the garden this time of the year, getting our plants looking great and everything else. But one of the problems that I've seen in my own garden and, and I'm hearing from people left, right and centre is getting the lawn up and going because in many places we've actually had a cooler, wetter winter than we would normally have had. And that's always going to test lawns. And, and particularly as those winter weeds die off, you end up with patches. You want the lawn to take off and grow really fast. But general lawn fertilisers take a little bit of time to get that momentum. There is a quicker way to do it, isn't there? Yes, there is. So um, liquid lawn 
I had a lot. is an option that most people do have. I mean, there's a lot of people that do use the granular version, yep. um, but a liquid version will actually be faster acting. Yep. Um, so you'll be able to deliver those nutrients to, to your lawn and get results in a much faster way. And particularly, like, we've got a, a few different products of liquid lawn fertilisers, and one in particular, which is our Extreme Green, will actually deliver results in three days. In three days. Now, three days. it's important that everybody understands that plants don't just feed through their roots, they also feed through their leaves. And mm -hmm. that's where liquid fertilisers come in and play such an important role. And when it comes to lawns, if you're feeding through the foliage, but also, and I wouldn't, wouldn't um, hesitate to suggest to people to use the lawn builder that they're used to using, um, apply that, but to get the lawn really up and jumping, to apply a liquid at pretty much the same time, the combination of feeding through the roots and through the foliage, the results are really quick. Extreme Green is one that I always recommend as we're heading towards parties, functions, Christmas, you know those events and you've got the family coming around and you're a week away and you go, oh, lawn's not looking as good as I'd like it. Hit it with Extreme Green. Three or four days later, lush, dark green lawn. Everybody walks in and goes, gee, your lawn's looking good. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, yeah, it is. I mean, definitely when you've got a special uh, a special function, a special occasion coming up, um, it's definitely something that's an easy way of being able to improve your lawn um, in such a short period of time. Um, and especially with the green, the greening of the lawn as well. So um, the products do work over a period of time. So you will see that growth um, continue, but you will see that instant or virtually instant greening um, yeah. within three days. Yeah, so it's sort of a three-day sort of impact and then really strong growth for probably seven to ten days, yes, by yeah. which point if you've also gone for the granular at the same time, that will have started acting in the soil and the, the roots will, because the plant suddenly, its metabolism is going, it'll draw it up and because that's actually there in the soil, you should see a really strong, thick, sustained growth of your lawn to cover over any patches or just to green it and get it looking yeah. lush and healthy. Yeah. There's nothing better than a lawn looking like that. Can you tell me, how do you apply it? So it's the easiest way. I mean, we know that fertilising the lawn is a very easy and one of the easiest tasks you can do to actually improve the health of your lawn. Um, and obviously with a liquid fertiliser with extreme green, and there's one, got one handy. Yeah. Um, um, you simply just click it into your hose and turn on the on switch and you spray. And that is basically... Basically, all you, you don't need to mix it. You don't need to worry about the product leaking. You don't need to worry about getting your hands dirty. It is yep. literally as simple as clicking the product into your hose, turning on the on switch and spraying. Wow, that is that is really easy. Now, how far does a bottle, because it's, it's, it's a nice looking bottle and it's, it's but does that, will that cover a whole lawn? Virtually, yeah. So uh, this one covers 180 metres squared, which is virtually your average size lawn. There's lawn. not a lot of, I mean, the average lawn is about 110. So yep. most people will definitely be able to just deal with the one bottle um, and obviously applying it, whether it's every six weeks or whether it's a little bit um a little bit longer in occasions um you will yeah you will go this will actually go quite a distance this is actually so to to bring people up to speed the reason you guys do this is that many of the products that you have in fact the vast majority of them like lawn builder are used at commercial level they're used by professional green keepers and turf turf managers and so on and they trust this this brand so they they know it. And for us as consumers, as home gardeners, we've got to get our hands on it. We, we know we're getting the very best. This is a premium. But this trick with applying liquids now is something that all the professional green keepers actually do. They, they apply over the foliage and they really do get very fast growth which and, and an instant change in the colour of green, which makes the world of difference to the quality of the turf. Vitally important yeah. if you're a professional greenkeeper, right? 
Yes, yes. And I mean, Scott's Lawn Builder has been within the industry for many, many years. So yeah. um, we do we do all our own testing here in Australia, I mean, and also elsewhere around the world. So we know our formulations are really quite effective and we deliver results. And we also test, you know, our products on a regular basis to ensure that everything is um, is meeting our standards. Yeah. Um, so, yes, it's something now, it's a product that you can trust. And now that we can party in Sydney and Melbourne again, and you're going to bring people over and go to the backyard. A dose of extreme green over the over the lawn right now is going mm-hmm. to uh, have it looking pretty good, lush, thick, healthy, and able for a bit of wear and tear for that backyard cricket game that we're all going to yeah, have. Yeah, well. definitely. I think I can wait until Wednesday, can't I? I can do it on Wednesday, and then I'll yeah. get ready by Saturday, so I'll be fine. <laughs> How good is that? It's as, as easy as as it's ever been for home gardeners mm. to get professional results. Mm. Obviously, relying on the great work that you guys do. With Lawn Builder, Scott's Lawn Builder, as is, is, you said, has been one of those just trusted brands because it works. Yeah. Absolutely. Nice. I mean, and, and delivering a healthy lawn, I mean, I think that's something that we've all appreciated over the last year or so is the value of our of our backyard space and even front yard space. I mean, yep. it's a place where the kids can run around and play Um, play sports we can relax in it Um, I I don't think there's ever been a more crucial time where our backyard has become more important yeah no I I agree with you it's such an important time also to make sure that you've got your lawn up and growing strongly as the as we've got more sunny days as the days daylight hours actually get longer your lawn will grow faster and it does need that nutrient support it is a very intensive um, plant as far as its, its nutrient needs goes Now's the time to do it. Liquid fertilizers, one granular fertilizers, put them together. You end up with the ultimate lawn and you get all of it under the lawn builder brand. Can't do any better than that, right? Yeah. (laughs) Alicia, thanks so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Trevor. Thanks. Look forward to seeing you again soon, hopefully in Sydney. Yes. Yes, that would be great. Okay. Enjoy. Hi. Okay, so we're back and we're back with the plant of the week. Um, So this week I've brought in a plant and it's called a a digiplexus. This is a hybrid plant. I'll keep that down low so you can see the flower. It's very much like a foxglove. In fact, it's a hybrid of a foxglove, the old digitalis, um, and the isoplexus, which is the Canary Island um, foxglove. Um, It's it's a newish plant to Perth, but I believe that it's been around for a few years now. Um, last year I think it was uh, brought into Perth and we had great success with it. Um, What I love about this plant is um, it will grow um, in all sorts of soils uh, given that it's a a fairly shallow rooted plant so you'll find that it'll grow well in sand uh, but it'll also grow in your heavier soils so you people out there across Australia with maybe the clay or heavy soils you can do this one also. Um, Digiplexus, unlike the foxglove, which will give you one flower spike mostly, sometimes you get two or three, but the digiplexus, especially if when you plant it, you take the middle, you snap the middle out of it, um, you'll find that by the time it comes up to flower, you'll have multiple flowering stems. Um, It's a really lovely little plant. Um, It's also, um, uh, it's it's really effective for bringing in the bees and the birds. So it's a good pollinator to have in your garden also. Um, There's numerous different um, uh, varieties and styles of it. So you'll find different colours that you can um, enjoy and it'll go in your palette that you like in your garden. So yeah, it's a great little plant. Um, Head down to the garden centre and see if you can find it. Digiplexus. Thanks. Um, So we're off to Laura, who's in Brisbane now. And Laura has, uh, my lawn is terrible, my ground is dry and compact, and now I have a lot of bindi and weeds. What would be um, the best first few steps in turning your lawn into a luscious grass? Well, let's um, attack the bindi and all the weeds to start with. And often they come in because your grass is sparse. So where there's room for weeds, they will appear. So it's, there's two things you need to do is um, uh, use a herbicide um, or dig out all of those bindi and the weeds if you've got the patience to do that and time. Um, and then I would uh, make sure that you get a good, excuse me, a good lawn fertilizer and um, fertilize that 
uh, and uh, you, you should find that it comes back. As soon as the lawn is fertilised and it starts growing into those areas where there aren't weeds, um, then you'll find that there'll be less weeds in your soil. Uh, one of the other things, if you don't have the time, um, let's say it's Monday today and you can't get onto it till Saturday, but the weeds are growing faster than what the grass is, get just go out and take the flower heads off at least. Take the seed heads off so that they don't go any further. In fact, you can just mow them off and then you can address them later. So I hope that helps you, Laura. Uh, nothing worse than bindi in a lawn, is there? Um, okay, so we're off to Rolly Stone. We're in, in Perth this time and it's Riona um, and she's wanting to know a good indoor plant that is dog friend, friendly and allergy safe to have. Um, look, um, I love the old fashioned, um, some of the old fashioned plants um, uh, and you've got the ZZ plant is a wonderful plant to try. Um, some of the philodendrons are really fantastic also. There's, there's actually a myriad of them out there that you could use. So maybe get onto your garden, local garden centre um, and they'll certainly be able to help you. I know that there's a huge amount of plants out there at the moment and that are safe for dogs and allergy free for yourself. Okay, so thanks Riona for your question. Um, so Erica is in Canberra and she's having problems with snails, slaters and airwigs eating all the new growth on her flowering seedlings. And can I suggest a dog and child friendly deterrent? There is. So you could start with um, sources of bear around your garden. Just uh, place the saucer down equal uh, width or, or level with your soil and you'll find that that will attract the, the snails into it. Um, you can do what I used to do and I used to pay my children to go out and collect the snails in the early evening. Um, that got a bit expensive. Um, however, that's a good way to do it also. Um, the other way is there is a, um, there's a product called Multigard and it's a, an iron product and it only affects um, the inside of the blue-blooded animal. So, and that is the slaters and, uh, sorry, the slugs and, and snails. Now, it is an iron and it's a potable iron. So when it breaks down in your soil, it is actually good for the soil. It's going to help it. Um, however, if you use it wrong and if you make the mistake and put clumps of it elsewhere, or stupidly leave it out on your garden table and it tips over and your dog or cat comes along, it's made of bran. And so it will attract certain animals, especially uh, some dogs will like it. Uh, now the dog is gonna to have to eat a good five to 600 um, grams for it to affect it, but it will really affect it. So there is no snail bait out there that is completely clear of it. Um, that is a good one though for, for some of us who are really busy, uh, but just use it very sparingly. And the other thing to do is don't necessarily put it around the plant that, you've, um, that you're trying to protect. Find the source of, the, of where the snails and so forth are. Um, so if you're growing Agapanthus, Clivia, Lamandra, Dianella, any of those strappy grassy-like plants, Take, go, find those and go to the middle of them. You'll find that they'll be very dry in the middle um, and that's where the snails and slugs tend to breed. So open the plant up, throw a few into the middle. Again, not too many, just in case you've got that really uh, adventurous dog. Um, but you'll find that if you go to the source of where they are, you'll, you'll be much better off than trying to protect every plant in your garden. Look, some people also say sawdust. If you can find sawdust these days, um, sawdust ringed around your plant. Um, also eggshells around your plant is a good idea. Um, eggshells last, last a lot longer and some people even use flour. So I hope that helps. That'll give you a few ideas anyway and keep your pets nice and safe. Um, so now we're off to the Hunter Valley and Margot um, has a blueberry bush that has lots of flowers but now it's growing lots of leaves, has, sorry, it has had lots of flowers but now it's growing lots of leaves and no fruit. Blueberry bushes like to be um, uh, in an acidic soil and if you feed your blueberry bushes, and I'm not sure what you're feeding obviously, but if you feed them a high nitrogen fertilizer, you'll find that they'll grow lots and lots of leaves and they'll look fantastic. They'll go green and they'll go lush and they'll go huge. 
and you'll get no blueberries. So that'll really is not a good sign. So what you want to look for is a good blueberry fertilizer. Make sure that the soil it's in in the pot is acidic. Um, take a sample to your local garden center. They'll be able to test it for you um, to see what the pH is. If the pH is okay, then what you want to do is follow it up with a really good blueberry fertilizer. Um, if you can't find a blueberry fertilizer, we're really lucky over here. We have one um, in WA made in the local hills and it's fantastic. Uh, it maintains the soil as well as feeding the plant. Uh, but if you can't, use an uh, azalea camellia fertilizer. It's certainly adequate and it'll help. But the key to it is the acidity um, and also the amount that you're, you're feeding it. If you're underfeeding it, it's not going to like it either. So stay away from the nitrogen high fertilizers and go towards something that's more for the acidic plants. And that should help you a lot. Okay. Well, now, this is the exciting time for this program, this today. Um, it's the moment we've all been waiting for. I feel like we should do a bit of a drum roll or something. Um, this season on the Garden Gurus, uh, we ran a competition to win $20,000 of edible garden makeover. Um, the winner will be announced in this week's episode of the Garden Gurus, but we wanted you to, um, to see it first. So take a look at this clip. During this spring season of the Garden Gurus, we ran a $20,000 edible garden makeover competition. We want to thank everyone for entering. After evaluating the entries, we've chosen a winner. Congratulations to Jesse James Argent for nominating his fantastic space. Jesse has a passion for gardening and his community, and this very special garden installation will be open to his neighbourhood, providing a space for the community to share and grow together. I think it's great what you've done so far, and if we can help you make more of a difference to the people that live in your community, um, I, I think it's a good thing. Sorry about that, everyone. Uh, that big lead up and then we have an IT glitch. So we'll get back to that, okay? Um, so in the meantime, we'll go on to some more questions and let's see if we can cover something from Melbourne with Suzanne. She's got lots of geraniums and some have lots of flowers while others just have leaves and why. Okay, so um, I can only assume that you're going to be feeding it the same um, fertilizer throughout your geraniums and once again, uh, like with blueberries, they don't like a high nitrogen. Anything too high in nitrogen, you're going to end up with lots of flowers, uh, sorry, lots of uh, leaves at the expense of flowers. But I'm assuming that that's not the case, given that you've, you've stated um, that you've got some with flowers and some without. So uh, the other thing that can happen with geraniums is if you overwater them, um, then they'll end up with a, a root rot and they won't flower. In fact, they won't grow very well after a little while either. So it may well be your watering practice or that your soil isn't well enough drained. Um, and it's confusing because 
um, you know, you'll have one meter of soil and it, it's perfectly fine and everything's growing really well. And right next to it, something else won't be growing particularly well. It's more often than not something to do with the soil. So have a look at that and um, hopefully that will solve it for you. And keep in mind a good fertiliser, a good liquid fertiliser, and that might bring it on. But make sure it's not overwatered or the soil isn't too, too gluggy. Um, okay, so then um, now we're down, down uh, past Melbourne into Geelong and Jamie um, is... He, um, I will move a lemon and a mandarin tree from the pot to a permanent position and he's planning to use sea sol after planting but would like to know what else to use when we recommend it. So um, look what we always say Jamie is that you need a good compost in the soil. Um, so I would be using a good compost, um, perhaps a little bit of chicken manure, well rotted, uh, make sure um, citrus do like manure, but make sure it's a well rotted manure. Sea sole is always fantastic when you're using it. Um, don't overuse it though, don't uh, use it. Um, I tend to use it half strength once a week for three weeks when I'm replanting something like, um, like a, a citrus. So hopefully that helps and good luck with that. Um, so off to Mount Gambia, which is in South Australia, and Samantha wants to know, I'm wondering why my daffodils didn't flower this year and what can she do to make them flower next year? So there's a couple of things, excuse me, there's a couple of things that you need to do, Samantha. Um, it, this year, you don't need to take the, the seed head off. Uh, but next year, when your plants do flower, that's the first thing you'll do is take the seed, seed head off so that they put all their goodness into the root system. And then what you need to do is make sure that you feed those plants as they're dying. So not all is lost. This year, uh, when your plants are dying and when the, the, the foliage starts folding over um, and going yellow, you want to get a good liquid fertilizer and feed them once a week, possibly for four weeks. Um, and you'll find that's when the bulb will decide how many flowers it's going to have for next year. So if it's well looked after, next year you're going to get good flowers okay that's good um aaron um in mornington peninsula i will i ever be able to grow a dwarf mango that will produce fruit he's got a sheltered north facing position um you should be able to look i'm not a mango expert i have to say that right now i haven't grown a mango i sell a few um, and i know a little bit about mangoes but not a huge amount for the Mornington Peninsula. So um, yeah, you should be able to, but what I would do is given that I'm not giving you the answer that you need, is get down to one of the garden centers there and ask them, they'll know, they'll know the right conditions and what you need um, for the Mornington Peninsula. Sorry, Aaron, it wasn't the best of answers, was it? But um, we can always get back to you if, if you don't have help from your locals. Um, so now we're off to Baronia in Victoria, and to be honest, I don't know even where Baronia is, but Tyson, um, uh, what is the best season for me to plant my tomato seeds? March, April, Tyson, that's when I would plant them. So you're a little bit late now um, if you're wanting to plant tomato seeds. So maybe what you need to do is get some tomato seedlings, and once the soil is warm again, and once we have some consistently warm weather, then I would be planting some seedlings. So not all is lost, Tyson. Um, try some seedlings this year and next year in March, April, then put your seeds in. Thanks for your question, Tyson. Um, North Coast of New South Wales and Gary, he's got uh, two dwarf apple trees. They've been in the ground for four months, so they're newbies. They are just starting to blossom and show some leaves. My trees have very long branches, four foot long. I was wondering if it's too late to cut the long branches back by 30 centimetres. Yeah, I probably would. Um, you know, I would also make sure if your dwarf fruit trees have just gone in, I wouldn't let them be uh, fruiting uh, for probably the next two to three years. Mm -hmm. They're too young, they're too small. Um, those plants, in my opinion, should have been pruned by the garden center or by the, the supplier that you bought them off um, and should have been half the size so that they 
then have uh, a better chance to, to work on their root system rather than on the, the top part of the plant, on the foliage. So yeah, take, take the um, fruit off as it starts coming through. I would take them back by say 30 centimetres um, and um, make sure that you give them a good fertiliser when the weather starts warming up for you also. So Greg's in Parkerville and he's got a couple of our natives around the a round leaf mallee and a physifolia um, have their new growth going brown and some black spots on the leaves. Would it be too much water and a fungal attack or rust? Should I do a foliage spray or is it due to them not being suitable for our clay rocky soils? That's a really good question, uh, Greg. Um, look, I've been saying this so much over the, over recently at the garden centre is that the we had three days of dry weather in July. Since last week, we had 30 mils come down. Um, and I s assume if you're in Parkerville, um, you're in a heavy soil, which is what you've actually said. So yeah, I would think that you've got a fungal issue. Um, and uh, I would, yes, I would be spraying it. Make sure that you get some gypsum onto your soil and open that soil out. Uh, so that it's 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 more open, that the moisture and nutrients can go down, but they also um, will allow the plant's roots to extend down in there too. And the, the bigger root system, the, the better it's going to be for you. Um, and yet definitely it's too much water. So Wilma. Wilma, the tips of my Cape gooseberry started to have rusty tips since a few days and I was told that spider mites, so it's been taking them off every day. Is there anything else I should do? Look, if you've got spider mites, um, I, I would, or if you've got mites, I would probably treat them rather than just take them off. Um, often, and consider where your plant is planted. If you've got spider mite, it's, it's often because there's not enough airflow. So uh, it's better off if you can plant um, you another Cape gooseberry next year, perhaps into a, a more open position, um, but definitely do something about them. And if you, you don't want to spray with, there are sprays out there that are, um, are organic, but you can also, there are, um, there are, there is a place called uh, Bugs for Bugs. It's a, a really good online service and they'll sell you some bugs that will help get rid of the, the mites, so you can do it totally um, free of pesticide. Okay, um, well, we've fixed our technical issue, um, so we're going to take a look at this clip. Enjoy. Thank you. All right, so we've just got these last uh, five questions after this, and then we're done. Just a sec, sorry, Joe, we've got a new technical issue that's popped up as well. Yeah. Just to press me yeah. on, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks for that, you did really well. Yes. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Jesse, um, congratulations! You got onto the short list. Thank you. No, I'm ecstatic to hear that. Pretty exciting, you know. At the beginning of this series of the Garden Gurus, 
we decided we would do something that is going to change somebody's life. And that is to build a $20,000 garden. And the level of interest within the community um, for a $20,000 edible garden is off the scale at the moment. So we, when we had the level of, of entries, it spent, uh, everybody spent a lot of time going through those entries because we've got to pick out somebody who is a really worthy winner. And there were so many worthy entries. Jesse, um, congratulations. You got onto the short list. Thank you. No, I'm ecstatic to hear that. It's pretty exciting. You know, at the beginning of this year, Jesse, um, congratulations. You got onto the short list. Thank you. No, I'm ecstatic to hear that. It's pretty exciting. You know, at the beginning of this series of the Garden Gurus, we decided we would do something that is going to change somebody's life, and that is to build a $20,000 garden. And the level of interest within the community um, for a $20,000 edible garden is off the scale at the moment. So we, when we had the level of, of entries, it spent uh, everybody spent a lot of time going through those entries because we've got to pick out somebody who is a really worthy winner. And there were so many worthy entries, so many people who deserve this. It's so hard. To... Sorry about that. This is my first show and I think they're doing it to me on purpose, actually. <laughs> okay, so, but we'll post the clip later. Um, in the meantime, I'd like to congratulate the winner um, and uh, say, great job. I love the work you're doing. So, a well, well-deserved win. Um, so, let's go back into some questions uh, just to finish the show off. So, we've got in Point Lonsdale in Victoria, Marlene has a Santa Ana lawn that she put down two years ago and with a few tiny weeds popping up. Um, she's been hand weeding, but recently there's been more curbside, which is level to the road height. And there's anything that and she wants to know if there's anything she can do to top the, these weeds. Yeah, look, there's herbicides out there There's um, that I would probably go down and, and take some of the weeds or take a photo of what the weeds are because uh, a lot of the herbicides are selective and know what sort of uh, will you do you know you've got a center and a lawn so let the person know the garden center uh, salesperson know what sort of um, lawn you've got and they'll be able to uh, get a herbicide for you um, either that or it's a cup of tea in one hand and a good weeder in the other and a lot of patience um, but a Santa Ana lawn is such a nice lawn, it's well worth the trouble. Um, Narelle, uh, thanks Caroline, that's really nice of you to say so. Um, then Narelle, North Beaches in Sydney, our hibiscus has got some critters eating the leaves, what can we use please? Well, again, it depends on what the, the critters are, what um, what bugs you've got on them. I know with hibiscus um, that aphids, uh, it's the natural habitat for aphids, uh, but they don't tend to eat the leaves. So I'm assuming that maybe by this time of the year, you've got lots of caterpillars or something. And it might be that you want to go down and grab some um, something like success. I like using success, um, uh, that or dipel. Uh, both of them are organic. Mm -hmm. Uh, but keep in mind that if you've got some rain coming in, then you'll also need to pre, um, redo them. So whenever you use something that's um, organic and natural, um, as soon as you re, re, put your reticulation on or um, the rain comes, the, it gets washed off. It's not such a systemic um, product. So, but there are, you can use those. And I, I would say, guessing that it's probably caterpillars. Okay, so um, off to East Gippsland and Jennifer, that's really exciting. She's found a lilac tree in her yard in East Gippsland. The tree was bare, so I'm assuming that it's one of the deciduous lilacs you're talking about and it had long spindly branches. How do I look after this? I'd probably give it a tip prune. And when I mean a tip prune, no more than 30 centimetres. It might take two or three prunes before you get it back into a really nice shape. Um, uh, make sure that you've got some good mulch around it 
that in Gippsland, I believe there's a fair bit of clay up there too. And I could be wrong, but if you are in clay, make sure you get some gypsum onto it. And again, that'll open the soil and allow the roots to go down and follow the nutrients and the water. Um, so, and then feed it. Don't overfeed it. Uh, they don't need it. Um, but uh, yeah, probably give it a fertilizer in spring and then in summer and then one again in autumn. Good luck with that though, because they're beautiful trees. Um, I removed two oleanders. This is Helen, sorry, in Adelaide, and she removed two, ole two oleanders and poisoned the stump. Is the soil around healthy enough to plant again in that area? Uh, probably not, Helen. Um, I would be more inclined to dig out some of that soil and replace it with some good organic matter. So again, get some good compost. I seem to be repeating myself, but it is a rule of thumb. Get some good compost when you're planting um, and then plant something into it that you prefer than oleanders. Um, so we're off to Mornington Peninsula in Victoria again, and it's Aaron. And can I transplant my one-year-old um, locust tree? And he said it's between 1.5 and 2 metres 1.5 high and two meters wide absolutely you can transplant a locust tree again make sure that you take a wide bound out from the tree um, dig a trench around the tree um, put in some sea salt or some fish emulsion solution into it let it soak down into the roots so that you're giving the roots the best chance you can take as much of the the um, root ball that you can and put it into some really good soil um, I would more, I would also, and I know that um, my locust trees are fruiting at the moment. Not sure what yours doing in Mornington Peninsula. You may not have had enough warm weather for yours to start fruiting yet, but if it's fruiting, be prepared to lose most of the fruit. Um, in fact, give the give the tree a bit of a chance. Take all the fruit off um, and the flowers off, and then um, you'll find that the tree will concentrate on its root system, not on trying to fruit. All right, well, I made it. We made it. Uh, great questions. I really appreciate those today. Um, excuse me a moment. Sorry, guys, you can tell I've been talking too much. Um, we're very sorry we didn't get all your questions answered today. Um, we appreciate you watching and I hope that you enjoyed the live stream. Um, Lachlan will send a message to all our seed winners from today's questions. Uh, congratulations to all of you. Um, hope you get bountiful amounts of um, fruit and veggie out of that. Um, the Garden Gurus is back on Saturday. We're playing at different times around the country. So make sure you check your local TV guide um, and then that way you won't miss us. Our stories from the Garden Gurus at thegardengurus.tv and your YouTube channel, uh, thegardengurus.tv. You can listen back on today's live stream and catch up on previous episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcast and Audible. Trev will be back um, on Monday um, at, for another season of The Garden Gurus Live at 12pm Australian Eastern Daylight Time at 9 o'clock for the WA viewers. Happy gardening, everybody, and thanks very much. This show is brought to you by The Garden Gurus and Evergreen Garden Care. Evergreen Garden Care and their market-leading brands are some of the most trusted consumer brands within the garden care market. They produce high-quality garden care products designed to help people create their own green oasis. Whether it's a garden, a balcony or potted indoor plants, they want to inspire anyone, anywhere to be able to easily create and maintain their own garden. To find out more about Evergreen Garden Care, head to www.lovethegarden.com. Garden Express are Australia's leading mail order gardening service, offering a wide range of quality garden products. Each week on the Garden Gurus Live, the team at Garden Express will share a weekly offer. So make sure after today's show, you jump online and visit their website.